one way to do it. Or you could take it one step at a time and be victorious in the new year. Join FaithBridge for a new series on practical steps towards a better relationship with God. Don't go it alone. Let's resolve for more in 2017. No more phony promises or broken resolutions. Just real people, real life. Merry Christmas. So that's where we're going as we head into the new year. I look forward to seeing you then. Welcome today on the Klein campus in Cinecourt East, Cinecourt West, up in the loft. If you're at the Woodlands campus, welcome. If you're online, however it is that you're here at FaithBridge, we're really glad that you're here. So as I somewhat customarily do at Christmas, I want to say, first of all, thanks to the uh, many of you who've sent in Christmas cards, Suzanne, my wife, uh, and I always enjoy seeing all the pictures and, and enjoying your cards. And But in lieu of trying to send back a card to the whole church, uh, I'll just show you our Christmas card photo. Okay, so you can see it on the screen here. Wesley is in sixth grade now and just knocking it out. William is in third grade and could not have enough sports in his life. And Suzanne and I are happily married and very grateful for all of the Lord's good blessings in 2016, which has been a most interesting year for all of us, hasn't it? In fact, did you know Merriam-Webster says that one of the most Googled words in 2016, as people have searched for the right word to describe their experience of this year, is the word surreal. And I think they're probably right. It has been a bit of a surreal year, hasn't it? Uh, as a matter of fact, a lady told me just the other day as she was reflecting on her own sort of emotional state following the recent economic challenges here in the Houston economy and a highly controversial national election filled with political fight, infighting. She said, you know, I just sort of wish somehow I could escape from all of it. And I bet she's not the only one. I understand that. You stare into the darkness long enough and any of us can start to feel that way, can't we? In this world of ours filled with wars and refugees fleeing, families who are being ripped apart by violence, racism, diseases, drugs, human trafficking, political darkness, terrorism, fear about your child being bullied, or if you are a child, fear that you might get bullied. Fear about where our country has moved in the last several years. Fear about where our country is going to move in the coming several years. Um, and if all of those things weren't enough. Just hit your hopes to the Houston Texans. And in a few days, you'll probably uh, end up in the tank as well. Though I'm rooting for him tonight. Let's all root for him. Go Tom Savage as the new quarterback, huh? But sports aside, there's plenty to get discouraged about these days. Even the most sanguine of personalities. Here's the thing, though. We have to realize... You and I, we're not the first people to come along noticing the fallenness of this world of ours. The world has been plagued with variations of all the things I just said for thousands of years. And it's exactly what the people of God were feeling some 2,000 years ago. They'd grown downright hopeless because God felt far away. He felt distant. He felt checked out. For 400 years, they hadn't even heard anything from God. And nobody since the prophet Malachi had had a message for them from God. And then I'm sure that there was any number who had just sort of said, well, I'm, I'm giving up even on God. But then one night, everything changed. Pow, pow, pow. The whole sky lights up like fireworks. And they're the angels whose now well-worn words caught those unknowing shepherds totally by surprise that night as they were tending 
their flocks. Let's, let's revisit a little bit of that angelic message and talk about it the next several minutes, okay? Look in your Bibles. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to uh, borrow one. If you don't, uh, the ushers are coming in the aisles, and you can even have the Bible if you need a Bible. It's our gift to you. Merry Christmas. Okay, so we'll go to Luke chapter 2. Just going to look at two verses, verses 10 and verses, verse 11, okay? But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that'll be gr- that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. Now, in that short passage, God was telling them and telling us as well three crucial things that we have to understand if we're ever fully going to appreciate Christmas. What are those three things? I'll tell you now. The first one is this. The world cannot save itself. That's the first one. The world can't save itself. That's just implied in this message that the angels were bringing to the shepherds. Now, even saying we can't save ourselves makes me feel a little bit bad because who of us wouldn't want to see all of us pulling together to save the world? I'm all for benevolent causes, And unity is a wonderful concept. And I don't like war, and racism, and violence are terrible. But the problem here is we will, the problem here is we'll never be solved by better world leaders, or by better education, or by better economics. Although I'm for all three of those things. Here's why. Follow me here. See, we tend to believe that all the world's problems are caused by those other people out there. All of us think of ourselves as the good guys. You know, I'm, I'm one of the good guys, right? The world's going to hell in a handbasket, not because of you and me, we tell ourselves, because we're on the good side. It's them we say to ourselves. If we could just get rid of those people, then the whole world, it'd be better. Game, set, match, right? And that's why many of us prefer to read or watch our news from either a conservative or a liberal or a middle-of-the-road perspective because it enables us to find our peeps and to hell with all the others who just don't get it and don't think that Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and all the rest don't understand this. It's how they make money. They're good at making us all come away feeling like our tribe is the honorable tribe. While all the problems of the world, it's because of those people. They just don't get it. But the Bible's analysis is very different. The Bible says our bigger problem is not out there, not with those people. The problem contaminating you and me is in here, where you discover your own selfishness and greed and lust and dishonesty. See, God never created any of us to have sinful hearts. He created all of us to be open-handed and generous and loving and forgiving and gracious and patient and pure and committed and loyal and faithful and honest and virtuous and, and reverent human beings. That's what he created you and me to be. But selfishness and sinfulness weaseled its way into each of our souls. And nobody even had to give you lessons. And when you were contaminated with sin and selfishness, something broke inside your soul. Just like a new Christmas toy that shatters on the sidewalk. But if, if you don't believe me, if you're like, no, nah, it didn't ever happen to me. You want proof? I'll give you proof. All you got to do to test what I'm saying is just press pause the next time you hear yourself hollering at somebody at your workplace or at your spouse or hollering at your kids or if you are a kid, hollering at your mom or dad. Need more proof? Just press pause the next time you catch yourself looking lustfully at somebody 
are flirting with somebody that you know you shouldn't be flirting with. Or looking at something on your iPad or on TV that you know you should not be looking at. And in that moment, you'll have all the proof that you need that you too have been contaminated by sin. It's happened to all of us. So what's the big deal? What's the problem with this anyhow? I'll tell you, sin separates us from God. For that matter, sin separates us from each other. For that matter, sin separates, it from, from, separates us from ourselves. And, and we find ourselves saying, I just can't live with myself after doing that. And so, though we hate to admit it, no matter how hard we try, we can't change ourselves from the inside. We can't get rid of all the sin. None of us can save ourselves, which leads to the second thing that we learn in this message from the angels. They teach us that, number two, we need a savior from beyond us who will come in and rescue us. And he did. And the message of Christmas is the message of our Savior's arrival to planet Earth. It's the reminder that 2,000 years ago, this God-man, Jesus, blasted through the wall that separated the spiritual from the physical, and he steps up to each of us. He steps up to you, and he steps up to me, and he says to each of us, I know everything that you've done. No matter how much you didn't want somebody to know it, I know it, but I still love you. And though you deserve death and separation from a holy God, I'm going to give you better than you ever deserved. I'm going to rescue you now. It's why he blasted through that wall that separates heaven and earth. It's why he was born into that manger over in the Middle East, where for 33 years he lived the life of sinless perfection that you and I could never live. And then for your sake and for mine, for the sake of anybody, whoever wants to be rescued, he died for our sins as our substitute, enduring in our place the hell and the punishment that each of us deserved. And then on the third day, he rose from the grave, triumph over, tri- triumphing over death, it's, it's signifying to all of us who attach ourselves, who link ourselves to him through trust, through faith, that we too in the end shall rise to life, life eternal and life abundant. It's so interesting, though, how many People, even those who study comparative religions, and I'm all for the study of comparative religions because there's nothing that we, there's no religion you can't learn something from. But so many people, even those who study it, uh, are still totally confused about Christianity. They still don't get what Christianity is about. I can't number the people who, who I've heard say over the years, well, I just hope at the end of my life that my life will tell the story of more good deeds than bad deeds, or that I'll have done enough to have found my way into God's good side of the ledger chart, which tells me you still don't get it. You still don't understand the uniqueness of Christianity that started on that first Christmas night. See, Christianity is not like any other religion. All the other religions, they are prescriptions of, they they have hoops that you got to jump through and hurdles you got to jump over and systems of regulations and rules that you got to live by, things that you have to do, whether it's an eightfold path or five pillars or ten commandments. But, But think, think about it just a minute. If you have to do those things in order to be found good enough in the end, who is the Savior at the end of the day, in each of those religions, you are. It's up to you. You got to save yourself. The onus is on you. It's all about your performance. Since salvation is an arduous process in each of those religions of trying to work your way back into God's good favor. 
So don't miss this. What the angels were proclaiming that first Christmas night, they were saying, good news. Not the same old news of every other religion. Good news. For unto you a Savior has been born from the outside. Which means in the end, Christianity isn't about your performance. It's about his performance. It's about Jesus and what he did. Because Jesus did something that neither Buddha, nor Muhammad, nor Moses, nor any of the others ever did. Jesus said, you can't save yourself. You'll just never be able to do it. So I have come to this world not to give another set of rules, not to give you some more regulations, not to teach you, here's how you rescue yourself. I've come into this world to rescue you myself. In the new movie, Hacksaw Ridge, which is a marvelous film, but appropriately rated R for its very violent war scenes, Desmond Doss, a young man from the hills of Virginia, uh, he enlists into the army as a medic to serve in the army so that he could serve his country while not violating his conscience to never kill somebody. Well, this pacifist approach certainly did not fit the army's typical model of what a good soldier would be. And so his sergeant and his captain and his whole platoon uh, there, they worked overtime to get rid of them before they went off to war. They beat them there in training camp. They harassed him. They threw shoes at him when he was praying. They did everything they could to drive him out and get him to go home. But Doss stood firm. He wanted to serve his country during World War II. He just wanted to do it in a way that he could feel conscionable about doing it as a medic. And so I won't tell you exactly how the army gave in, but I will give you this spoiler alert. Doss gets to go with his platoon to Okinawa, and it's there they face a grueling task. Scale a deep, jagged cliff known as the escarpment, which in the film is called Hacksaw Ridge. And once they got to the top of that escarpment, they would face thousands of Japanese soldiers who were armed and waiting to unleash the floodgates of hell on them. And when they got up there, hundreds of American soldiers perished that day under the barrage of gunfire and explosions. But Doss, he managed to get to the top and stay alive. And when nightfall came, he kicked into action to fulfill the mission he'd always spoken of fulfilling. By cover of night, as the wounded lay in agony, Doss crawled from wounded soldier to wounded soldier, dragging those severely injured soldiers um, to, to the edge of the escarpment. And then he developed a system for, for tying them up with this rope and lowering their bodies down one by one to the bottom of the cliff where the medics beneath awakened to the miracle of what was happening above while they had thought all had been lost. And so they scramble into action and they get busy starting to receive the injured beneath and triaging them into the medical clinic. And as the hours of the night goes on, Doss's hands grow increasingly bloody. The skin on his hands is worn to just mush by the rope burn, but he wouldn't quit until the mission had been accomplished. And through it all, he keeps praying to himself. And you see it in the film, Lord, please help me get one more, just one more. And the Lord did help him. And by sunrise, he had saved 75 wounded GIs from certain death. And you come to the end of the film and all those soldiers who had shamed him at the start stood around him praising Doss and his unceasing determination to rescue the dying. He had saved the very men who had bullied him, who had brutalized him in the barracks during their weeks of army training. And towards the, the end of the film, I'm telling you, I wanted to stand up in the theater and shout, if you like Doss, get this, people, another savior, even better than Doss, has come into this world. And he's a savior for you. Because just like those soldiers, you can't save yourself. 
You're sick unto death, and you need a Savior from the outside who will come in and rescue you. And joy to the world, that Savior has come, and his name is Jesus. But I restrained myself to Suzanne great relief, figuring this would be a more appropriate form for me to proclaim such good news. So Christmas, don't you see, is all about our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came into this world, who grows up, and then who says to us, now, you're sicker than you ever realized, and you can't save yourself, but I can, and I'm here to rescue you, so now let me carry you back to life. That's the second thing that we learn from Christmas. The first, that you can't save yourself. The second, that you need a savior. Now look at verse 11. This will lead us to the third thing. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The third and the last thing that we learn for today is that you can be a person of buoyant joy. Not only tonight, not only tomorrow, but you can be buoyant with joy all year long. Sure, the world is a dark place. Always has been, ever since sin and selfishness and suffering crept in. But the arrival of Jesus that night shows us that even in this world of darkness, you don't need to be robbed of your joy. Because Jesus brings an inner joy to life that can't be found anyplace else. And so, what's the matter with us? Why are we cowed by our problems? Why do we live our lives with our tails between our legs? I'll tell you, when we start focusing on our problems and our burdens and our worries, we begin losing sight of the fact that our Savior has come and will someday come again. And we get distracted from the main thing, and we start putting our eyes on all these other things. And we mustn't do that, friends. Because if you've really been rescued by the Savior, do you really want the message of your life that others are picking up by watching you and listening to you? Do you really want that message to be hopelessly undercutting the reality that Christmas ever really happened? Christmas is a message of joy. And so if you understand what happened that night, And if you've entrusted yourself into the arms of our great Savior, people around you should be picking up a message of joy. Regardless of your circumstances. Now, I'm not denying the realities of pain and suffering and death and anybody's life. And I realize that we have a lot of it here today, all those things. But what I do want you to see what I do want you to remember, remember, is that for all those things, no matter how dark they feel, for this, you have Jesus. And he can rescue you, even from the depths of despair, even from the depths of depression, and he can lift you above all of that, and he can, and he can splash your soul with waves of indescribable, indescribable joy. Not just on that day when you first place your trust in him, but daily, ongoingly, as you journey through the rest of your life here on earth. And if you don't believe me, just ask Isaac Watts. Who's Isaac Watts? He was a man who lived in the 18th century, and he wrote a lot of music. He wrote like 750 songs. And that was way before Pandora. He kind of was Pandora. Well, this woman, her name was Elizabeth Singer. She was so inspired by this music that Isaac Watts was generating that she wrote him a letter. I suppose kind of like all his groupies would have done back in the 18th century. But her letter just struck him in a different sort of way. And one thing and another, they continued uh, corresponding. And they fell in love with each other through the mail. I suppose it was kind of like an 18th century version of a Facebook affair. And they decided that they were going to get married. But remember, they never met each other in person. So the time was arranged for their first meeting. And they could hardly wait. And after rushing to find each other, she was stunned Perhaps he just never mentioned to her that he was only five feet tall. 
with an oversized head and a hooked nose and small eyes and pale skin. I guess you could say Elizabeth loved the jewel of Isaac, but just couldn't stand the case which contained it. And I'm sure she'd probably been expecting, I don't know, a more normal, virile man of six foot three or something like that. So she returned home, never to marry him. And he was, as you might imagine, heartbroken, shattered. But look at what he did. Isaac Watts poured himself back into his writing. And even in the midst of lifelong loneliness, he just kept looking to Jesus, his Savior. And of the 750 or so songs that he wrote, one of the most famous is one still sung all around the world at this time of year and even sung here in all of our rooms today. That song is called Joy to the World, the Lord has come. See, beneath all the pain, beneath all the disappointment, Isaac Watts could still have an abiding sense of joy. Not because he somehow found a way to escape the pain and the darkness of his world, but rather because he had swung the doors of his heart wide open to Jesus Christ coming in and reigning inside of him. And Jesus can reign inside your heart as well. See, when the Lord meets you in your darkest points and bathes your tears with his amazing grace, you'll begin to experience his peace that surpasses all understanding. And you'll be, as C.S. Lewis said, surprised by joy. Jesus told this to us himself. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome this world. And I've told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He's the only thing that can complete us and fill us ultimately with never-ending joy. So when something happens in your life or your health, or your wealth, or your comfort, and you're not in Christ, you will be decimated, but not the Christian. Not the Christian. The Christian's different. The Christian just goes back to the truth of Christmas and rehearses it all year round and looks at it and reminds himself and herself, if this is really true, and it is, then no matter what happens to me in this life, my real riches are safe above. And in the meantime, I can be at peace, not frantic, come hell or high water, because my great Savior will carry me through to the end. So here's my closing question. Have you come to know him? Have you received this ultimate gift of a Savior? Have you entered into a personal relationship with him? Have you connected to him through faith, through placing your trust in him, not in your goodness, but in his? And have you surrendered to his lordship, his taking charge of your life? You say, well, how does that transaction occur? It occurs through prayer. You just talk to him, you tell him plainly, I need a savior to forgive me of my sins. And I'm ready to receive you as my Savior to make you the Lord of my life, Jesus. And you put your trust into him. Let him pour his amazing grace into your life this Christmas Eve. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the message that you gave to those angels that night to give to the shepherds, which is still a helpful word for all of us, even today. Thanks for the good news, for the reality that we can't save ourselves, but that you did send us a savior. And as we connect to him, for the reality that we can be people of joy. Now my prayer, Lord, is that each person here would move closer to you in this 
moment than they were when they came in. For those that have known you and walked closely with you, perhaps for years and years, that they might come in even closer to you yet and surrender even more of their lives to you even now. And I pray for those who here have said, you know, I don't think I ever quite understood it all this way, but now that you put it this way, it really all makes sense. And I think I would like to take Jesus into my heart, even in this quiet moment. You just tell him that. Why don't you just talk with him directly? And others of you still, you might say, well, I have found this very helpful and very interesting. I don't know that I'm quite ready to invite Christ into my heart and life, but I am ready to do a little bit more investigating about all of this. Well, you just tell him that, why don't you? And why don't you follow through with that as we move into the new year as well. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace, and for this night. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come towards the end of our service now by coming to the Lord's table. And uh, I'll just explain briefly what it is that we're talking about when we have the Lord's Supper. After this baby Jesus grew up, 33 years later, he went to that cross to die for your sins and mine. But the night before he went to the cross, he gathered up with his 12 disciples. And he uh, sort of explained to them, uh, here's what's going to be happening. And I want to leave you a tangible way that you can have access to all of this for years to come. And he took the bread there in that meal and he gave it a new meaning. He said, now he broke the bread and he said, now this, this is my body. And it's broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And he said, now I want you to, to come. Every time uh, you come and you gather and you take the bread and you take the cup, you're going to remember me. And you're going to remember everything we just talked about and why I came into this world to rescue you. And so we're going to come to the Lord's table uh, in just a few moments. The way that you'll come is as the ushers lead you uh, towards the stations at the front of all of our rooms and in one of our rooms, uh, the one that has the balcony, you just follow the leadership of the, of the ushers and they'll guide you and you'll come to one of the baskets at the stations. You'll take a piece of the, the bread, the cracker, the gluten-free cracker, and you'll dip it into the grape juice and then you'll partake. And then you'll be given a candle for the last thing we'll do tonight, this afternoon. And you can take that candle uh, back to your seat as you return to your seat. If you would like uh, prayer before you go back to your seat, why don't you just go to the front in each of the rooms where you are. And if you would like to pray with somebody, not by yourself, you could pray by yourself, but you, if you would like someone to pray with you, um, you look for one of the prayer partners that are wearing red shirts. And you just motion, they'd be happy to come and pray for you, however it is that you could benefit from their praying for you. And then we'll return uh, to our seats. And in the meanwhile, the musicians in all of our rooms will be leading us, and we'll just be singing uh, Christmas carols. And I will ask you for this uh, just favor for the sake of those who are coming before you or those who are coming after you. Uh, let's maintain a spirit of reverence in all of our rooms uh, throughout this last portion of the service. All right, so I'll pray, and then the ushers are going to lead you, and at that point, you will come. Let's pray now. Lord, thank you for um, all that we've talked about today, for the good news that you've given to us, that there is a Savior, and that we can know him, not just read about him or sort of know distantly about him, but that he came so that we could have a relationship with him, talk with him ongoingly and daily, pray to him, and hear from him through your word so that we could actually know him and journey with him. Thank you for this Savior. Thank you for the forgiveness that comes, for the hope that comes, for the joy 
that he brings. Now, Lord, in these uh, next several minutes, we pray that you would meet with us as we come to commune with you. Thank you for even leaving us this, just this tangible way to get back to the truth of everything we've talked about today, to access that, even just using the bread and the grape juice. And even in that moment, just how we can access all the truth of this and you meet us and remind us of the truth of all that we've talked about. Won't you meet with us in all of our rooms as we come and minister to each of us, Lord, at our points of greatest need. None of us has the same need because all of us are different, but all of us have a need. Help us to be real with you and to talk with you as we come in these next several minutes to commune. And we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.